We've got some, some really interesting speakers coming along to speak to you this afternoon. And we're moving on to really thinking about, you know, where we keep talking about our big question about where should the balance between government and parliament lie in terms of power to, to, to make different types of decisions and take different types of actions. And we're really going to start sort of teasing that out a bit more this afternoon. This morning was much more around, you know, making sure we understood the function as it is at the moment. And now looking at what, you know, what could be done differently. So when we're thinking about the balance of power between government and parliament, we're also really thinking about like how much should government or an elected government that has the majority there actually be able to do on its own without needing wider parliamentary approval. But also there's questions of alternatively, how much of a constraint or a limit. So going back to some of the things we were talking about, limits on governments last, uh, last time we met, would you want parliament to actually be able to have or how much should Parliament be also able to set its own agenda? These are some of the sort of key questions we're going to be looking at. And it does look like we've got everyone back. So I think we will go straight into our presentation from Meg. You heard from Meg this morning. You're going to be hearing from Meg a bit this afternoon. Um, just to sort of set the context a bit more around some of the questions we're going to be focusing on today. Thank you, Kayla, and welcome back, everybody. I hope you had a good uh, lunch break. Um, I'm aware we've bombarded you with a lot of information this morning about government, parliament, and the relationship between them. We're not going to keep bombarding you in that way, but from now on, we're going to try and focus down on a more limited set of questions. Let me share my screen with you with a set of questions. Hopefully you've all got that. Um, it should be clear that both government and parliament have an important job to do and that they also have an important relationship with each other. The various presenters have pointed to some natural tensions in this relationship and some important trade-offs regarding where the power should ultimately lie. To a large extent, government's role is to supervise and keep a check on government. The government is only the government because it has the confidence of parliament. But the government, ministers and the civil service have their own important job to do. Sometimes power flows in the other direction with government controlling aspects of what parliament does. So the question is, where should that balance lie between the power of government and the power of parliament? And does the answer vary depending on what kind of power you're talking about? Drawing from the various talks, we've identified six separate questions about this power balance, which are shown here on the slide. These are all questions on which opinions differ, as we'll see later in our afternoon, in the afternoon in our advocate session. In each case, there are trade-offs regarding the merits of government control and parliamentary control. So I'm just gonna walk you through the questions briefly, and then there'll be plenty more time for discussion later today and tomorrow. The first question, question A, is what the right balance is between the government's ability to uh, the, between Parliament's ability to publicly scrutinise the decisions made by government and government's ability to get things done. This is basically about transparency, one of the key principles we discussed at the previous weekend of the Assembly. Transparency and scrutiny take place through various mechanisms that Farah and Jill discussed this morning, for example, parliamentary questions, government statements to Parliament and select committees. On the one hand, you might argue that government should be able to get on with making policy decisions without having to appear too often in front of Parliament and answer awkward questions that might slow it down. On the other hand, you might argue that the government being open about its decisions and answering questions in public is important for transparency and accountability, and also that public questioning may keep government on its toes and make sure its decisions are sound. Question B concerns legislation asking to what extent government should be able to make new laws without parliament, full parliamentary oversight. Both Farah and Jill talked about this as well. It's similar in a way to question A. You might on the one hand suggest that it's efficient and sensible for government to be able to make some legal changes, perhaps on smaller or less or smaller or more urgent things without full parliamentary oversight. On the other, you might argue that without full parliamentary oversight, government lacks accountability and mistakes could be made. Question C also concerns lawmaking, asking to what extent Parliament should be able to make laws independently of the government. You've heard that backbench parliamentarians have the right to propose bills, but that it's difficult for these to succeed. 
Some might argue that it's right for government to maintain a high degree of control over new legislative proposals because it has more, more resources to carefully think through policy and can make sure everything fits together. On the other hand, if there are key issues that the government isn't attending to, but that parliamentarians, who after all represent the public, can potentially get majority support for in parliament, these proposals should be able to go through. The other three questions relate back to my presentation this morning. Question D concerns who should decide what parliament gets to discuss. Under one model, which is basically what we have now, the government maintains quite tight control to ensure time is protected for its proposals and it doesn't have to deal with too many competing ideas. On the other hand, it can be argued that if a majority of MPs want to discuss something, even if the government disapproves, as elected representatives, they should be able to do so. Question E relates to when parliament sits when it goes on a break and when it can be recalled from one. Should the government as a kind of coordinating authority make these kinds of decisions on parliament's behalf or should members of parliament themselves be able to decide? Lastly, question F concerns the calling of general elections. What's often referred to as the dissolution of parliament when one parliament ends and a new one is elected. Should the prime minister be able to propose an early dissolution of parliament to hold a general election before its five year term is up, or should this require the approval of members of the House of Commons? These are six quite different questions, but they clearly have some similar themes. You might instinctively think that all the power should lie with one side or the other. You might think that on some of the questions it's right for government to have control and on others it's right for parliament to have control. You might think that on some questions the power should be shared. These are the kinds of issues we'll be getting into a, in a lot more detail the rest of this afternoon and be able to discuss further tomorrow. Thanks, Kayla. Hey, thanks, Meg. So, we, yeah, as Meg said, we are going to start focusing in on some, some more specific questions around where this balance of power lies. But what we're going to do right now is before we, we start getting into discussing those questions in more detail, is just do a quick quick poll within the room um, about some of your initial initial sort of thoughts and initial feelings about where some of these some of these questions fall. So we're going to use a tool called Mentimeter. So I think Charlotte, if you could share the screen and show how we get into Mentimeter. Some of you may have um, seen Mentimeter in some of the warm-up calls and things like this. I know that's a while back. But Mentimeter is a little polling tool that allows everyone to vote and everyone to vote anonymously online. So there are two ways you can get into it. I've posted a link in the chat now, which will open up another window, just like if we use Jamboard, that will open up another window and it will take you to Mentimeter. Alternatively, you can use, if you've got a smartphone and it's easier than opening up another window, you could use a smartphone or just open another window on your computer or your tablet and go to the website www.menti.com and then you can use the code there 1783981 to get into the poll. Now, when you go into the poll, you will see a little opening screen that says welcome to Mentimeter and asks you to sort of tick the little thumbs up sign to let me know that you're in there. So I ask everyone to try and go in there now. If anyone really isn't able to, to access the poll, there's two things you can do. You can either just send your answers in the chat to the support team and we can put them in for you or hold on to them. And once you're in your breakout groups, we can get them added to the poll later. So we won't close the poll, even if you're not able to necessarily get to the vote right now. But please do, if you can, try and get into Mentimeter or let us know if you're having trouble and we might be able to help you. So I can see about half of you are in there already and have given me a little thumbs up. So that's a good sign. Yeah, if anyone is having problems, do just let us know and we'll see what, if there is a way that the support team in the background might be able to help you get there.
Okay. Let's see a few more people coming in. Now, just to make sure that everyone's able to use it, we're going to do just a, a kind of quick test question first that, uh, you know, is just a bit of fun to get us going. There's still a few more people to join, but hopefully everyone will be able to get on or do let us know and we can see if we can help you. So the first question should be appearing on your screens now. And it is, are you a cat person, a dog person, or neither? You may recognize animal from the Muppets. So I think, um, Charlotte, we can probably take the that screen down now, unless anyone still needs it, do let us know. Take it down. Kyla, I'm trying to get in, but okay. you, you asked the question, but I missed it because I'm trying to get through on this stupid thing, um, but not having much success. So what was it, something about a cat person? Oh, it, it, the first question is just a simple play one. Are you a cat person, a dog person, or oh, I see. a... Okay. Yeah. So it's just a, a little test question. Oh, okay. Does anyone else still need the screen up? You're saying if I click on this link, that should open up? Yeah, the link in the chat should open up the same as uh, if you're opening it. up. It doesn't do anything on this iPad. You might need to copy it and paste it, like... I don't know, it might be the same as when you're using the jam boards or others. Yeah, it won't let me do anything with it. Uh, and I can't it do it either. It won't allow us to copy. That's the tiresome thing about it. Yeah, the that's the problem I'm having. Can't copy that. Oh. Hi, it's Rory now. I can't get in either. And now I'm just on my phone. <laughs> I'm just on my phone. And I... I tried the phone and then I went into the internet and did it the long way around. You can't, you can't copy from the chat. Yeah, write it down. You need to click in, on it in the chat or else it is. Okay. go in another way. Yeah. Right. Hello, I'm just on my phone and I can't get through to anything. Just uh, earrings, that's it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's, Sorry, yeah. it's, just, it's just Mohammed. Uh, through the phone, I found it, it's, uh, it's a bit more difficult trying to install in that but if they go through the chat it seems to be easy i got through the chat quite easy yeah you shouldn't have to install anything or or register if you go through the phone but you know each person's might be a little bit different yeah my phone's asking for registration and what subscription package would i like <laughs> yeah <laughs> doesn't normally do that that's a bit weird <laughs> i don't know where hi it's, hi it's story and i've managed to get in on my smartphone good good Look, we've got, we, we, will, we will try and solve this for next time we use it, but we will, um, Charlotte, can you take the screen Kayla. down? Kayla, yes. sorry, just, um, Ed is just in the background. He's going to send a link to people. If you've given us your mobile phone number, you'll get a text message with the link. So that will maybe be easier for people. Okay. While, while we're waiting for that to happen, let's find out our first results before we go on to a a kind of real question. So I think one of the most important results that's going to come out of the assembly after all is that we have <laughs> learned that yeah. by and large, the majority of you are dog people. So we've got more than half of the people who've been able to answer so far are our dog people. Around a third cat people. And not very many fans of the Muppets. That's very suspicious, considering that so far on cameras, I've seen a lot of people with cats, and I haven't seen any dog shop on people's webcams yet. So, <laughs> oh, and this is where we come back to like, hopefully people, hopefully people aren't lying to us, you know. And just that reminder: when we go into the questions next, which actually are kind of real questions. Um, there is no right answer. There is, there's no right answer. There's no wrong answer. It's not a test. But please do try and answer as, as honestly as you can. 
So I think we could go on to our next question now, which is, it should move forward for you there. When you're deciding how to vote at a UK parliamentary election, what would you say you mainly think about? Is it the candidates which, the candidates which um, best represent your constituency and therefore the parliament? Is it the parties which think would make, you know, the best government? Is it both of those things equally? Something else entirely? Or actually, you know, I normally wouldn't vote. So if you're thinking about a UK parliamentary election, what are you mainly thinking about? And we'll just give people a few minutes to, to answer this one. Anyone who hasn't managed to be able to get onto Mentimeter, you can either send your results to the support team and we can add them in, or uh, we can get them added in later for you. But these are not final decisions by the assembly. This is just something to take the temperature of the room at the minute so we can get into our conversation. Okay, I have a question. Uh, yeah. how, do I have to type it in? Because it's not letting me do it. I was trying to pick the option down here or one of them and I can't do nothing. You should just be able to tick on one of them and then the hit knows. submit. Hit what? There'll be a submit button, I think, at the bottom. Uh, it says leave. Hang on, let me cut. No, uh, you you shouldn't be on the Zoom screen. You should be on your your own screen where you are answering the questions. Well, it says what, when are you deciding how to vote at a UK parliamentary election? What would you say you mainly think about? So maybe I'm, turn off the screen share just to avoid confusion. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I've just done that. <laughs> so what do I do now? So can you see it on where you were answering the first question? No. Nope. Wherever the link took you to? Were you doing oh, it on oh, your oh, phone okay, or? Okay. Yeah, okay, here we go. I yeah. think, hang on. Uh, from lead facilitator. Um, really, I don't know. I'm really lost. Do I just hit it on that link again? Lead facilitator. Yeah, should be able to do that. Okay, it looks like I'm in Mentimeter. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs> I'm All good. Right. Yeah. Look, we, we, we're learning new stuff and we're trying something different, but hopefully, you know, we can we can start using some of these tools as people get more familiar with them, but it will always take a bit of time. So, so what I, I am going to do now. Sorry, I'll press it, but I don't, I can't get down to submit. Oh, oh never mind. Never mind. Okay. 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 I'm going to share the results for this one now. Okay. So it's going to pop back up on my screen so you can see the results, but then we'll go on to a third. Actually, rather than confuse things, let's go on to and do our third question and then we'll see the results. So while everyone's still there, this, the third question is on a scale of one to 10, where one is completely with government and 10 is completely with parliament, where do you feel the balance of power should lie? between parliament and government in a good democracy. And as Meg said, there's many different stages that, or a different sort of situations, different considerations that may come into your head. But on balance overall, where should the balance of power lie? And it's not necessarily just a choice of completely with government or completely with parliament, but somewhere along that, that 10 point scale. So I'll just give people a couple, a couple more moments to, to come to their answer uh, can there. You, I can't actually get into the screen. All right, so we'll have a bit of a practice and we can see if we can do it in the, maybe use the breakout rooms where you can get some support directly for individuals or somebody else can add it in for you. So what I'm going to do now though, is we know there's a couple of people who haven't been out of vote and that's okay because again, you know, we can add it in later. You can tell your facilitators, they can note it down and we'll make sure we can add things in later. But just to get a sense of what we have got in the room, I now am going to share my screen. So just come back to Zoom and you'll be able to see in a moment because I went out of it while I went to get to see if I could make it work. Okay, um, one sec and I will share my screen.
So for the first question, where we were considering what people mainly, mainly think about when they're deciding to vote in an election, the one that's come up most, so a third, just over a third of people, are really thinking primarily about the parties that would make the best government. Yeah, almost a third, so almost as many again, then thinking both equally about whether it's, you know, thinking about who's going to represent their constituency in parliament and what party would make the best government. And then a few who are thinking about something else entirely or actually, you know, normally wouldn't be voting. And then for the second question, we have fallen pretty much almost exactly in the middle. You can see that sort of 5.5 there on that scale of one to 10. The 5.5 in the middle is the average across all the people who were able to vote. So we're just slightly, you know, that the balance might fall, might be better to fall closer or more with parliament. But you can see from the sort of the light blue shape in the background there, that actually that's the range that's the range of different scores that people gave. So we've definitely got some people in the room who at the moment, their kind of gut feeling is actually completely with government, you know, uh, or, or definitely veering towards completely with government and others who are saying the balance of power really needs to be completely at the other end with parliament. So again, we do have a real range of opinions and hopefully that's gonna make for some interesting discussions when you get back into your breakout groups. So I'm going to leave it there um, and pop you into your breakout rooms, I think now for a little while, just to think back on some of the like initial thoughts, some of the questions Meg was posing there, and also the questions that we've just posed in the in Mentimeter. So we'll open up the breakouts. So we're going to go on to be hearing a bit more exploring some of those questions that Meg raised right at the beginning. We're going to be doing things a little bit different this time. Um, so we've actually got a panel to come to speak to you and they're going to be having a bit of a conversation with Meg after sort of doing some introductory remarks as well. And then there'll be an, off, an opportunity for you to be thinking up and identifying some questions that we can come back together in plenary and put to the panelists. So that's really all I need to say and I'll hand over to you, Meg. Thank you very much, Kayla, and uh, apologies, everybody, you'll hear quite a lot from me <laughs> this afternoon. Um, I'm really delighted to be chairing this panel uh, where we're going to dig in a bit more to those questions that I put up before and you were just discussing in the breakout groups. We've got two really excellent speakers, um, one of whom is going to kind of advocate for the strong government position and the other one who will advocate for the strong parliament position. The government speaker is uh, Sir Stephen Laws. Um, he spent a long career um, working for the government as a lawyer, uh, involving the very important role of drafting legislation on behalf of the government. So he knows both government and parliament very, very well. Hannah White, you've actually met before. She came to a previous weekend. Um, she has a background working in parliament as a parliamentary clerk. Uh, but for the last few years, she's been a researcher uh, at the Institute for Government, which is not part of government, it's an independent organisation which researches and commentates on both government and parliament. Both of them have spent their entire careers working in politically neutral positions, so if I say Stephen's speaking for government, it doesn't mean he's speaking for this government, he's worked for governments of all political hues, and Hannah likewise um, has worked in neutral positions um, all the way through her career. Each of them will introduce for five minutes. You'll have a moment for reflection after each talk, and then we'll have a Q&A uh, between myself and the two speakers for about 15 minutes um, to tease out their views on the questions and also to try and understand the questions a bit better. I'm relying on them to give me really short answers so that we can get through the questions, but there's gonna be plenty more time for questions later on from you, the members, uh, you'll have an opportunity to submit questions and we'll have a second Q&A later on after your afternoon break. Um, so I think that's all from me for now and I should hand over to Stephen for his opening remarks. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm down, as you've heard, as the person more to the strong end of the uh, strong government end of the argument. And that may make you think I believe the relationship between parliament and government 
involves a test of strength, a competition for power, or a natural state of conflict in which it's necessary for me and for Hannah uh, to take different sides. That's not what I think. Instead, the great virtue of our constitutional arrangements, in my view, is that in practice, they require government and parliament to work together. They make consensus building and respecting the views of others more important than who wins the conflict. Of course, like all man-made arrangements, they are also capable of improvement. But improvement here should mean getting better at working together in the way I've described. Two ideas are my starting place with the UK constitution. First, what really influences the decisions that politicians make is what it is politically possible for them to persuade others to accept. Rules that lay down what can and cannot be done are very much less important. After all, the system allows rules to be changed. Secondly, everything affected by political decision making is connected. You cannot line up the decisions and make them separately one by one. You have to make sure that all your decisions fit together. Political decisions are often like the decisions for picking a sports team, suitable subject for Saturday afternoon. Uh, you do not pick the best team by picking the best player for each position. You need to pick the players who will play best with each other. Selecting a player for one position depends on who is cho chosen to play alongside them, but also vice versa. So in government, for example, you cannot decide how to fund one part of the system without considering whether the funding you provide will require less funding for other things. Every decision to change something can have complex knock-on effects elsewhere. And at the same time, it is itself also affected by all the other decisions you make on other matters. The effect of this is that someone does need to be democratically responsible and answer for how all the decisions fit together and for the knock-on consequences that result from everything being connected. I say only the executive, the government can carry that responsibility. It alone has the capacity to pull things together and the staff and the other resources to make sure they all work in harmony. Parliament, which comprises many members with conflicting views and certainly no unity of purpose, cannot exercise the direct control that is needed to perform that role and only a person with control, who can't pass the blame on to someone else, can be made answerable. This is why I think the job of making new policy proposals should always ultimately rest with government. That leaves Parliament's role, the one that it can perform best, to be first responding to government proposals by questioning them with a view to improving them, and secondly, ensuring that government accepts responsibility and answers for what has been done. So where does that get me with today's questions? Well, question A, transparency is absolutely essential in order to allow government to be held to account. Of course, government should not keep things secret just to make its life easier. But I think that this question is really about something completely different. It is about deciding the stage at which policymakers should ask others outside government to contribute their comments to the process. I knew the dog would start barking at that point. Uh, you should not ask too early and risk being told that it is impossible. You should not, sorry, you should not start too early and risk being told that it's impossible to contribute because your ideas lack sufficient detail. Nor should you leave it too late, working up all the detail first, and so risk being told that, as you've obviously made up your mind already, what would be the point of contributing? I suspect the answer here is that you cannot make firm rules for the right moment, but that there will be a political price to pay if you choose the wrong one. Uh, question B. You will have heard about secondary legislation today. It's new law that is made without the same detailed scrutiny in Parliament as is given to an Act of Parliament. The less detailed scrutiny, though, will always be something that Parliament itself has decided to allow. And the difference between primary and secondary legislation are often in practice not as great as is sometimes made out. Also, when secondary legislation is used for doing something that Parliament would really like to look at more closely, it will usually in practice be possible for Parliament to ensure it does look at the matter more closely. The answer here, in my view, probably lies in considering whether parliamentary procedures can be improved so that secondary legislation that Parliament decides it would, after all, like to look at more closely, is identified and does not slip through the net. 
Uh, question C to E, I think we can talk about these in more detail later. They all raise for me a similar question about how much more parliament can do and should control without that undermining the role of government and by undermining the role of government, making it more difficult for government to be answerable to the electorate for what happens. And on the last question, question F, uh, what I think is important to identify there is how much the question or any answers given to it are not really about who should be, are not really about who should be able to trigger an election, but about whether and when an election could happen, someone should be able to stop the electorate from having their say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. We'll just take that small pause, that 30 second, just to kind of note down anything that sort of stuck in your mind or that you might have further questions about. And then we'll move on to our second speaker. Okay, I think we're ready to move on to our next speaker. Hi everyone, it's great to see you all again. Um, my role today is to put the case for the strong parliament side of uh, this debate. Um, and the argument that I want to make to you all is that it's to all of our benefit for parliament to play a strong role in our constitutional setup, potentially a stronger role than it's currently able to do. Good scrutiny by parliament of government makes for good government. And just because government needs to be able to get things done, that doesn't mean it should be able to restrict the ability of backbench and opposition MPs to have their say. Now, Meg framed a number of questions and Stephen's just gone through some of those. I won't cover them, cover them all in detail. Question A was about how we find the right balance between parliament being able to conduct scrutiny and bogging government down. Government undoubtedly has a big and complicated job to do. And it's not desirable for Parliament to be able to intervene in every decision because that really could slow things down. But we do need to ensure that Parliament has enough opportunity to scrutinise government because better scrutiny makes for better government. If Parliament doesn't get the chance to ask the right questions, there's less chance that possible flaws in what government is planning to do and decisions it's planning to, to take will be identified and, and there, there won't be a chance to rectify those flaws. And there's more chance that government will be able to avoid awkward questions about things that have already gone wrong if, it, if Parliament doesn't have enough time to conduct scrutiny. And, and if you can't ask those questions, then important lessons might not be learned for next time. And that's why I think question D is really important. Who should decide what Parliament gets to discuss? Now, it's not an exact analogy, and it may have come to mind because I have just moved house, but if the government has too much control over what Parliament can talk about and decide, it's a bit like you deciding to buy a house on the basis of the estate agent's particulars. But the person who's selling the house, being able to control which bits of the house you can look at, whether or not a surveyor can come round, and what questions they'll answer about that house, you might feel in that situation that you haven't had the opportunity to ask everything you wanted to and to know everything about that house before you made the decision to buy it. And the extra information you might, might have found out through that process might not have stopped you wanting to buy the house, but it might, for example, have changed how much you were willing to pay for it. In the same way, parliamentarians might not want to oppose government policy decisions altogether, but they might want to suggest changes or highlight problems which their constituents raise with them that the government hadn't thought of. And it's not just government MPs that have the right to be heard. We all elect MP, we all elect our MP in our, their, our own constituency. Some of those will be backbenchers, government backbenchers. Some of them will be opposition MPs. They should all get the opportunity to express their views. And if government has too much control over what parliament can ask about and discuss and decide, then there might not be the opportunity for those views to be heard. And then there's question B about to what extent government should be able to legislate fully without, without full uh, parliamentary oversight. And Stevens rightly said that government can only make secondary legislation, the laws that get much less parliamentary scrutiny, 
using powers that Parliament itself has handed over at some point in time. Parliament has to have given those powers to government for it to be able to use them. But in recent decades, ministers have brought forward an increasing number of proposed laws uh, where instead of setting out their policies and enabling Parliament to ask questions about those policies, they simply ask for powers to fill in the detail afterwards. And the reality is that when a bill like that starts going through Parliament, there's very little that MPs can do to force government to spell out policy detail in the primary legislation. So they don't really have much choice about whether to grant those powers, especially if the government has majority and can push the legislation through. So over time, government has accumulated more and more powers to make secondary legislation and has done more and more using secondary legislation. And in my view, too much is done without full parliamentary oversight. Just one final point on legitimacy. In our system, we elect MPs and the government is made up of a subset of those MPs. So the government's legitimacy, the reason we all think it's OK for it to make decisions on our behalf, comes from Parliament. If the government just wants to get on with governing and tell Parliament not to interfere, it's cutting itself off from the very body which gives it the legitimacy to govern in the first place. Meg's asked a set of further questions, and I'm sure we'll get into discussion about those. But my starting point on most of them is that in Westminster, our government has an unusually high degree of control over Parliament. And there are some real downsides to that. Thanks very much. And we'll just give you that sort of again, 30 seconds or so to sort of reflect on what Hannah said, take down any notes before I open it up for, uh, hand it back to Meg for the discussion. And Meg, over to you. Thank you very much, Kayla, and thank you to both of the speakers for those introductory remarks. There's a lot to cover here, um, but I'm just going to try and quiz you, um, if, I, if I can manage it, on each of the questions on the slide, just one question to each of you. So really short, pithy answers would be very much appreciated. So if we start with A, which is about levels of scrutiny, you both seem to agree that it's healthy for there to be scrutiny of government's policy in Parliament. But Stephen, I suppose it's primarily a challenge for you, speaking from the government side. Are there times when you think this goes too far? Could you give us an example? You need to unmute. All right. The keyboard shortcuts never work with this. Uh, uh, I, I, I think scrutiny is a good thing, and uh, indeed it inherently is, uh, so it's a rather loaded question. But uh, what I ask myself is what scrutiny is for, and it seems to me it's primarily for two things. Uh, it, first of all, it provides a political filter in Parliament where the political acceptability of what the government is proposing to do is tested. Uh, and secondly, it's part of the process by which uh, people um, are brought to accept change legislation is always only about change. People are brought to accept change and to accept its legitimacy. And I think if scrutiny is confined to that, uh, it, it, it is fine and desirable, uh, but that the process by which Parliament scrutinises legislation always has the capacity to expand and actually become a mechanism for obstruction and delay. Uh, and in those circumstances, it's not constructive. It would only be fair to ask Hannah, like, I suspect you'll say no, uh, don't think it could go too far. If you're thinking about things like questions and select committees and so on, can they get in the way too much? Yeah, well, I mean, I think a good example to think about right now is uh, during the pandemic. Uh, it's always the case that the Department of Health gets more parliamentary questions asked to it than any other government department. During the pandemic, even uh, more the number of questions questions that MPs wanted to ask the Department of Health shot up and uh, to, to members to please be judicious about how many questions they asked the Department of Health because actually the, the department was trying to deal with the pandemic and couldn't spend all its time answering parliamentary questions. Okay we've heard a lot about primary and, and secondary legislation which will be new concepts to a lot of people here and we've, we've heard 
the broad parameters, but I think it might help to make it real for people if we could hear some examples. So Stephen, could you give us an example of good use of secondary legislation where there's less parliamentary oversight and government can make decisions quickly? Well, I, I think I'd mentioned two sorts. First, first is where the question whether what the government is proposing to do is capable of being answered with a simple yes or no question. I mean, an obvious question would be fixing a figure in an, an act of parliament, putting up a, a rate of benefit or something where uh, you, you don't need three stages in order to decide whether one number is the right number or not. You can answer it yes or no. So, um, and you're going to be doing it regularly. So you use secondary legislation so you can change things. Uh, and another example is where you're regulating um, a, an industry. And it, it comes back to the first uh, point, I, I, the first question I addressed when I spoke, which is, when do you consult people? Very often, uh, government isn't ready to come out with its whole policy, but it's driven by other timetables to do something. So it says, well, here's our broad idea, uh, accept this. When you've accepted our broad idea, we will be able to go to the people affected and work out what in detail we, we re will require them to do. That's a good use of legislation, uh, secondary Maybe legislation. Maybe I can stop you because we're yeah. going to run out of time if we're yeah. not careful, but that might be a good point for Hannah to jump in because you might have an example of where that kind of boundary sits in slightly the wrong place at the moment, according to your point of view. Yeah, so one example, which fits quite neatly because it's one of the first categories where Stephen said, you know, it's a good idea. We have an increasingly complex welfare state and it's good to be able to use secondary legislation to just adjust the, level, the levels of different benefits and so on with inflation and so on. I completely agree with that. But then in 2015, for example, uh, the government then tried to adjust the level of tax credits to do something which would have amounted to a £4.4 billion cut in tax credits. Now, the power had been given by Parliament to government to be able to change uh, tax credits in, for exactly the reason that's, that Stephen envisaged, but the House of Lords said, no, we don't think this is an appropriate use of that power to make this really big cut. And actually, if government wants to do a big policy change like that, it should have done it using primary legislation. Okay, and there were lots of examples under COVID, which we might come back to later because it became quite controversial in that period as well. Um, Stephen, private members legislation, non-government bills, am I right in thinking that you think government should ultimately be able to block a bill uh, that's come from private members if it doesn't approve of it? Uh, yes, I, and, and indeed most systems, even systems where the executive and the legislative legislature are completely separate, as in America, uh, have systems for an executive veto on legislation. Uh, and it, it's what I was saying about everything being connected. Uh, and particularly anything that involves money uh, is uh, connected to everything else. So uh, if government is going to take responsibility for how much money the government raises and how it spends it, it needs to be able to block being forced to spend it on things that are not part of its plan. And Hannah, presumably you disagree with that. Um, do you have any examples of things that maybe the government has blocked that it shouldn't have blocked, things that private members wanted to do and couldn't that, that people that people might wish had happened. I think there are the point is private members bills. Sometimes it's things that that private members think are a priority, which might be for a small group of people or whatever, and the and, and the government just doesn't think it's a priority to spend time on. So that the, the government doesn't want to sp to spend time on it. I mean, there are lots of different uh, things that private members bills seek to do that different people will think a good idea or not. Just recently, we had the example of a bill which is designed to stop firms firing people and then rehiring them in order to get them to accept different working conditions. Um, and that was stopped, even though you know there's a lot of support for it, actually, but the government decided not to let that go forward. So there are lots of examples. There's another interesting contemporary example just in the news today about assisted dying. Some of you will have heard there's a bill in the Lords at the moment, which is a private member's bill. And I suppose one thing is, you know, would it be right if the government blocked that, if Parliament wanted it? That that's that's a very very contemporary example. Stephen, you, you yeah, I think it's whether. Heard... Sorry, go on. No, I was just going to say that is, private members' bills have been used a lot to um, make decisions on sort of ethical social issues. The question is, should the government be able to stop MPs making a decision on it if they want to make a decision on it, not whether it should deter to determine the outcome. 
Stephen made reference to the later questions only very briefly and said we might come back to them and we're running out of time rapidly. But um, in a nutshell, Stephen, how much power do you think the Commons should have over its, over its own agenda? Well, I, I don't think I'm going to be very different from Hannah here. I think it should have as much power over its agenda as it needs in order to carry out it, what it is its proper function, which is scrutiny. Uh, but it shouldn't have so much power over its agenda that it should be capable of taking over government and trying to trying to govern using laws because laws are not a way to govern they're just a way to change the background against which other people have to govern which suggests that what you're what you're saying there is the time should really be given to considering government proposals and parliament's thoughts on government proposals is that fair Yes, it is, because it's government proposals that determine what happens for everybody, and uh, they have to all hang together. That's my point. Hannah, is there an opposing view that you would put? Have we lost Hannah? I think we might have think, lost Hannah. Oh, here we are. I think she's frozen. Yeah, she's frozen. Okay. Stephen, you get another go. Let me off the <laughs> well, oh, we, E. We're, um, we're, running in, we're running out of time. Uh, Stephen, um, are there things that could go wrong, do you think, if uh, gov if Parliament had more control of when, over when it sits? If, for example, Parliament could trigger a recall during a break? Uh, well, I, I think things could, could go wrong uh, if uh, that were used in order just to play political games or to, uh, or to try and disrupt the operation of government. And I, I think we saw a bit of that. I mean, uh, that the prorogation is incredibly controversial, but its only practical effect was to wreck the Conservative Party conference, uh, which um, is uh, a dubious use of um, a power of Parliament to, or, or in that, that case, the courts, to, to change what had been decided about when Parliament should meet. Hannah, sorry, we lost you for a minute there, and we're, we're running out of time, but on the recall running. and recess question, um, are there things do you think that go wrong as a result of MPs not being able to trigger a recall and relying on government? Yeah, I sometimes think it's the case that the, there are things going on that government wants to be able to just get on and do without having to account to parliament for. And if they happen to fall in a parliamentary recess, I think it's really unfortunate if there's no ability for MPs to say, actually, we think these are the, there are things here going on that we want uh, to ask questions about. An example would be, um, some of the riots that happened in England uh, uh, some, some time ago now, but they happened during the summer recess. Uh, there were real questions about the policing of those riots, but because it, it, it was happening in the summer, it wasn't possible for Parliament to ask MPs about the policing and, and how it was happening, which was affecting lots of people's lives. And after all, Parliament is to be able to um, uh, allow ministers to be questioned on these important sorts of issues. Kayla's itching for us to finish. Do you want us to cut out the last question? We can, I ask it very when quickly? we come back, I think, I think we've given people lots of things to think about. We need to let people have some time to absorb. We are coming back for another Q&A session um, with, with Stephen and Hannah, but we're going to go into the break. Let, let me just now. tell the members what the last question was, and they can think about it, and they might put it in their own questions. True. I was going to ask True. Stephen, what's the problem if M with MPs being able to block a prime ministerial call for an election? And Hannah, what's the problem uh, with the Prime Minister being able to call an election without the approval of MPs? So you might want to reflect on that in the groups. But we'll see soon. <laughs> All right, we are going to break up rooms now till uh, half past, and then you'll get a break. So we'll have a 10 minute break at half past, and we'll see you after that. Hey, that looks like all the breakout rooms closed. Hopefully you managed to drag yourself away from the conversation to get yourself a, a, a cup of tea or a cup of coffee or whatever else you might fancy on a Saturday afternoon. I've seen a few of the, the mugs popping up every so often on, when I'm looking at the screen, which is good to see. So we are going to go straight into now the sort of Q&A with Stephen and Hannah. Meg, so I know you were creating questions. Uh, there's a lot of questions, which is great, which is great, but actually we might not get through all of them. Some of them are sort of similar across some of the groups, so Meg's going to group some of them together as well. But hopefully we've got 25 minutes now 
and we're going to get through as many of them as we can before giving you a last little chance to try and sort of draw it all together in your heads at the end of the day. So over to you, Meg. Okay, thanks, Kayla, and thanks to everybody for the questions. There's some really good ones in there and way too many, so I apologise in advance um, if we don't get to all of them. I'm trying to group them um, according to some of the themes that were raised in the, the A to F on the slide. Um, maybe we could start with secondary legislation. There's some quite crunchy questions there, and I'll, I think I'll throw maybe three of them at you at the same time, and you could roll them up, Stephen and Hannah. Um, so group one asks uh, a very simple question. Who decides what is secondary and primary legislation? Oh, yeah. um, group four asks, are there areas that can't be touched by secondary legislation? For example, can changes be made to healthcare, education, defense? I might add in the creation of new criminal offenses, for example, through secondary legislation. Um, then group nine asked to what extent could firm guidelines be set for government to follow secondary legislation to prevent it using it to steamroller through policies. Um, and a very practical question again, how much secondary legislation is there? Group 10, how significant is there? How, how significant is it in the system? Who would like to go first? Maybe Hannah, Stephen was going first a lot previously. Would you like to oh. pick from those? I'll pick some of those. Um... So who decides what should be primary, what should be secondary? So the fundamental thing is what does government have the power to do? So government can't do something using, using secondary legislation unless it's got a power somewhere in primary legislation that was given to it by parliament at some point in the past to do something that way. But there's also a political choice. So sometimes you could do something using secondary legislation but actually you think it's too big an issue, too important, you actually do want parliament to have the chance to discuss it. So you would use primary legislation to do that, to provide that opportunity. So it's, there's, some of it is to do with sort of what powers are there, but some of it is to do with politics. Um, um, in terms of um, how much secondary legislation, I mean, it's a, it's a ever growing sort of curve. It did go up a lot uh, when we were in the EU because one of the ways in which uh, EU legislation that was passed in the EU was made to apply in the UK was to do it using secondary legislation and that's obviously dropped off a lot uh, but as I said before and, and Stephen said because uh, lots of things to do with the welfare state and so on are done using secondary legislation and our welfare state has got more and more complicated over time uh, the, the amount of stuff during, done using secondary legislation has gone right up so I think you know uh, typically, typically speaking you have uh, the government would pass sort of 30 or 40 acts of parliament in a year in a parliamentary session. Uh, the number of pieces of secondary legislation, which remember were to do much smaller things typically would be more around a thousand uh, or, but actually in recent years, because of Brexit and because of COVID, the numbers have been higher because lots of things have had to be done in both those contexts using secondary legislation. So I hope that answers a couple of those points and maybe, sorry, Stephen, I've left you. Then let's pass over after. to Stephen. I think, I think there's a challenge for you there, Stephen, the question about how can we prevent it going too far? How can we, how can we ensure that government doesn't get completely carried away with itself through this route? Well, I, I, I think uh, there are political factors that determine that government tends not to ask for secondary legislation to do particular things because it knows that Parliament's going to react badly to that. So um, criminal offences is one in most contexts. Um, amending primary legislation is one that always comes up that, um, that uh, government is reluctant, I think, to ask for power. I mean, it does do it quite often, but it's reluctant to do it uh, because it knows that it's going to be controversial if it does, and, and things that affect freedoms like uh, powers of entry and arresting people, all those sort of things uh, are things that uh, if government is taking power to do them, it, it knows it will have trouble in Parliament, so it, it's likely to try not to have to ask for them because that's the way political factors work in uh, legislation. I mean, I'd, I'd, I didn't get a chance earlier to say the one occasion when I thought... Uh, not the only one, uh, the one occasion when I thought um, they asked for too much. And that I thought was the, the system for uh, when smoke, the smoking ban was introduced. The smoking ban was a general ban and there were powers taken to define what a public place was. It seemed to me that a, what a public place was in that 
area was a thing that was crucial for Parliament to make a decision on. It's, it was the, the substance of the whole requirement. Uh, and the Parliament, the government shouldn't ask for that sort of thing. And generally it doesn't because it knows that Parliament will ask for something different. And that that's the factor. Um, Parliament doesn't have enough time to deal with everything of government. It has to make a selection, it makes that selection partly in advance when it decides what powers to grant, and partly later on when it sees how the powers are being exercised. I, I uh, you, you, mentioned something, you mentioned something very technical there, which maybe yeah. deserves a little bit of unpacking regarding using secondary legislation to amend primary legislation. So yet yeah, sometimes government asks for a power that allows it to amend another act of parliament using secondary legislation. I think this is quite hard to get your head around. They call them Henry VIII powers. If anybody's heard of yeah. Henry VIII powers, that's what it means. And that is controversial. It is, and in some countries, not allowed. Um, let's move on to private members' bills, where there were also a number of questions, uh, starting again with the sort of very basic uh, coming from um, group two. How many private members' bills are there? How successful are they? And what's the selection process, presumably for what gets debated and, and decided? And then group four asked, um, how, what's the process for generating a private members' bill? And can government always veto a bill or can private members have enough support to drive it through parliament? Really good question there. Uh, and then the third question uh, from group three, um, if the it, interesting thought, could there be a mechanism that if private members bills are rejected by the government, you could have some way of involving the public, giving them the ultimate say in whether they want to see this legislation, something like a petition on the parliamentary website or something. So um, should we go the other way this time? Stephen, would you like to start? Uh, private members bills, but you can have them in the Lords and the Commons, but the ones that tend to get past unless everybody agrees on them including the government uh, are the ones in the commons and there's a ballot and 12 of them are given a, a relatively good chance of getting through but in all of them it's usually possible for the government if it's got the political ability to do so uh, to stop them getting enough time it's not it's not blocking them and voting them down it's uh, not giving them enough time to get through uh, and government can normally block them uh, unless there is so much political support for them that the government feels obliged to allow them to go through. Uh, a lot of the private members' bills that do go through, uh, the uh, dirty secret is they're actually, they're actually uh, government bills that have been handed out to private members uh, because private members want to do something. The government's got things it wants done but um, doesn't have time or the ability to do it itself, so it suggest the private member introduces a bill and they get through and that's that's the ones that most get through but what are they for private members bills what private members bills are best at is putting pressure on government to address an issue that government has wouldn't have addressed or wouldn't have addressed as seriously uh, without the bill uh, the question whether the bill passes in the end or not is not always the most important question the question is whether government's attention has been turned elsewhere um so and government then, can I'm just re realizing that some people may not recognize this terminology private member so if effectively we're talking about backbenchers individual backbenchers who can rally support for, for bills, bills in bills bills introduced by someone other than the government yeah yeah i probably started this trend so i should put it right <laughs> hannah would you like to come in can you give us any stats on how many there gonna... are and success rates and so on? Yeah, so I mean, there are different sorts of ways of uh, proposing uh, a private member's bill. And some of them, as, as Stephen says, are much more likely to be successful than others. So in theory, there could be around 300 private member's bills ideas a year, but some of them really don't get beyond the, here's an idea for a bill stage. Um, and don't even get caught drafted, you don't get the text. Someone asked about the sort of selection process for them, and I think that's, that's really a good question. Uh, one way, is, as Stephen said, is to get a chance to do this. The, mo the biggest chance is to be successful in a ballot. So it's complete random chance uh, which private member, <clears throat> um, which backbencher gets drawn out of the ballot and gets a chance to do this. 
uh, other opportunities are, you know, you're much less likely to succeed, so it's less relevant. I do think it's a really interesting question that was asked about, could you involve the public? One of the ideas that's been put forward to improve the private members bill process uh, from within parliament is that it shouldn't just be a ballot, it shouldn't be just be about chance, you should have a committee of MPs to whom backbenchers have to come and say, here's my idea for a bill, and by the way, I've got some cross-party support for it, and that, you know, this is why it's a popular idea, and other people also support it, and then that committee, that cross-party committee could say, actually, we think these are the ones which have the best chance of success and can demonstrate uh, and there, you know, you might bring, you might pray an aid as a petition that's been put forward on this, and you know, so many million people also support it. So, uh, and that proposal that, has been made, hasn't it, by a committee uh, of the House of Commons? Why has. has it not been debated and voted upon? Because the government hasn't given time for that proposal to be debated <laughs> and voted on. And this is a really important. This is part of my argument that um, you know there are things, ways in which, and you know, Stephen said. Some, some of the problems to do with the balance of power between government and parliament are to do with improving parliamentary procedures. And in lots of cases, there are ideas for improving procedures, but if the government doesn't see them as in its interests and doesn't give time for them to be debated and voted on, then those ideas can't go anywhere. So you can't improve the procedures. So we're a bit stuck. Hmm. I think the system is a little bit sort of risk averse, isn't it? There, there, there are fears of change where will it take us could it have unintended consequences and sometimes it does become a bit stuck I think there's a direct challenge here for you Hannah there's a couple of similar questions so I'll stick with you for a moment group six picking up on what Stephen said um, asks if parliament wanted to put through legislation how can we stop that having an adverse effect on other things sort of destabilizing the government's program or you know um, and then there was another question very similar from group 10 if Parliament has more power, where does that leave the manifesto and the agenda for the government that's been elected? Does it get in the way? How would you respond to that? So I think there is a, a really important point that Stephen made about the government needing to be able to be held account to account for the legislation that is passed by Parliament. And if Parliament started passing all sorts of different policy proposals and spending lots of money and that, that sort of being public money being sp spent on the say-so of a disparate group of MPs, um, who would then hold them to account for the fact that that was a, a policy? I think what I'm arguing is more that they ought to be possible for policy ideas to come from places other than government and to be have a stand a chance of success. And you know, the whole uh, point would be to have a chance to debate those and discuss those properly, and then the government can point out. Uh, actually, this doesn't work for the following reason, or we actually we don't like the way you've drafted this piece of legislation. And the other the other point that you know Stephen said, you know, was saying some private members' bills are in fact government bills. The other thing that happens is that a private members' bill is is brought forward, which might have all sorts of unintended consequences. But the government concedes the principle that it's a good idea and says, well, we'll go away and we'll draft something that actually won't have those unintended consequences, but will achieve the same aim. And we'll introduce a bill to do that. And an example um, of where that happened, um, uh, sort of an example of that was upskirting. So there was a private member's bill on upskirting, which actually got uh, talked out. Can you explain so what that means? So it's to create a criminal offence uh, for people taking photos up people's skirts in public or, you know, up their inside their clothes in public. And that was talked out actually by a government uh, backbencher so he kept talking so the bill ran out of time and couldn't be discussed anymore but there was such an outrage sort of at such an outcry from the public that then the government said actually we will legislate on this and they drafted their own bill and then that that went through so sometimes that does happen I'm just arguing the balance ought to be more towards parliament being able to come up with ideas that haven't necessarily occurred to the government uh, not necessarily on the biggest issues, not reorganising the NHS or, you know, uh, going to war, but on, on more uh, specific topics and that those ought to have a greater chance of, of getting on the agenda. OK, brilliant. Thank you. There's a direct challenge for Stephen here, I think, that's come from Group 6, just to expand uh, or clarify one of the things that you said, that you said both parties, and I'm taking this to mean um, government and parliament rather than political parties, you suggested that they should work together for the common good, but how can we make that happen? What, do, what does that mean in practice? Well, I, I, I think what I was trying to say was that 
parliament and government should work together on the same thing rather than each of them having their own program and trying to push them forward in opposition to each other. I mean, in the sense that uh, what, what Hannah has just described seems to me to be the best way. I think uh, when you're talking about um, backbench legislation, pr private members' bills, uh, too much focus can be put on the fact that they're legislation. People think Parliament should be concerned with legislation because it's the legislature. But um, in the end, the reason ideas that are generated in Parliament result in government bills is because government has all the resources. Government can see what, what's needed, who's needed to be put in place to enforce something if you change the law, uh, how various things are going to be funded, how, how the law is going to be publicised so that people know about it. All those things are within the exclusive province of government. So inevitably, when an idea is arisen, the detail is going to have to be worked out in government. And, and I'm, I, I don't object to that at all. I think it's the right way to do things. I'm not saying nobody should think of anything in a new idea in Parliament. What I'm saying is that if you're going to make a good job of uh, giving effect to it, you need to involve government together with the people who had the idea. And that's what I mean by working better together. OK, thank you. There's a couple of other really interesting questions and we're running out of time. So try and be quick on these if you can so that we can get them uh, both in. Um, Group five says, um, doesn't the majority that the government has really determine the balance of power between government and parliament, which would suggest that it fluctuates over time. So government is strong now and maybe at other times is less strong. Do you, do you go along with that? Hannah. So I would say, yes, when government has a bigger majority, it's easier for it to just have an idea and, and to do it the smaller the majority the government has, or in a situation like we had uh, relatively recently when we had minority governments, which were governing without a, a majority or only with an agreement with other parties to support them, uh, then they have to negotiate a lot more and they have to only do the things they really want to do. And they only have can only do the things where they want to, are able to persuade enough, of, enough other MPs in parliament to, to do that thing. Um, so, so you're right. Um, I think the important principle behind this, though, is that, yes, you know, the majority of the government may determine exactly what happens. That shouldn't necessarily, though, necessarily um, also determine everything that happens in Parliament in the sense of it will determine the outcomes. But it's still really important for alternative views to be heard, for minorities to be able to express their views in Parliament. Uh, and for things not to necessarily just be railroaded through without the opportunity for discussion and change. Stephen, is there anything that you would add to that? Well, I'd, I'd, I'd add two things. Firstly, it, it seems to me wholly right that a government with a big majority should be able to do more than one with a small majority because it's got more public support to start with. And, and that's a, a, a good feature of the system. The other thing that there is, though, that there is a paradox. There was a minister called Francis Pym uh, in Mrs Thatcher's time. Uh, whom she sacked because he said uh, that they didn't want a really large majority at the next election because the backbenchers would be much more difficult to keep in order. Uh, so a government with a really large majority finds that it's having to do a lot more to keep its backbenchers um, uh, happy. And th this is the sort of hidden feature in government is that a majority is not enough for a government to... Um, uh, to, to satisfy what it needs to do. Uh, the government wants to keep all its uh, supporters happy and, if possible, attract some other supporters. So it's always trying to please more people than just a majority of its members. And that's why it doesn't do all the things that people fear it might do, uh, even though it has the power to do them, because it, it always knows that it, it it's looking for more support, not just to make do with its majority. Yes, we spoke earlier a bit about backbench power and that fits very much with that. I think this this idea of the size of the government's majority is actually really useful in thinking through these questions, because if we're thinking about how the system should work, it needs to be fit for purpose, both with a big majority and a small majority. And while Stephen says, yes, of course, governments with big majorities, it's understandable if they have more power vis-a-vis -vis parliament. One of the things that came up was whether a government without a majority should be able to control the parliamentary agenda to the extent that it does. So you've got to think about something that works for a government with a big majority, but also works when there isn't a majority. And that when you're in your groups and thinking about where you are on the scale, you might want to bear that in mind. Can, can, can I come I in? I want to on... get one, the one last question in, Stephen. Be quick. 
Well, uh, uh, only that small governments, uh, small majority governments need to be able to govern until the electorate can come up with a different answer. And that's why it's sometimes important that the only way that they can uh, be defeated is to be thrown out for an election, because otherwise they couldn't do anything and the country would be in a state of uh, blockage until the electorate was prepared to elect a majority government. So that's a factor too. But then when the Good government has the, about elections altogether, yeah. as I say, with the, if the government has a majority, has, has the ability to determine when the election is, then they can stay in power regardless. Well, as, but, as but, but they don't. Achieving anything. They don't. Let's, let's get to this the, last question, otherwise Kayla's going to get very, very Commons angry. can always vote them out. Um, the, uh, group 11 had two really nice questions, which I think I can just roll up really into one question as two sides of the same coin. They asked, from the speaker's personal opinion, do you think the system's working well? And if not, why not? And what kind of political reforms would you like to see? Should we start with Stephen and end with Hannah this time? Uh, well, as I said, I think everything, there's always room for improvement. And uh, I indicated one of them when I think that uh, the way the House of Commons decides uh, and looks into, uh, into what's coming before it and what's important, uh, particularly with statutory instruments, that uh, the tirade, legislation. Yeah. Yeah, um, sorry, I'm just just decoding what you said. Sorry. Yes, sorry. <laughs> um, the 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 triaging, you know, to take the hospital analogy, you know, see, seeing what's serious as it comes in, uh, is something that I don't think Parliament does do, and I think that that's where I would concentrate on improving parliamentary procedure. Um, okay, Hannah, what's 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 working well and not well, and what would you change? So, I mean. The system works well in the sense that, you know, generally speaking, governments are able to, to have a program and, and to achieve what they want to achieve. I think I would make three observations. I think we have too much legislation um, in this country. The governments, governments generally spend too much energy passing legislation, partly because they want to say we are doing something and a good way to indicate to the voters that they're doing something is to pass legislation and not, not necessarily um, you know, there could be more time spent with Parliament doing other things, debating other other topics and so on. I think our, our Parliament's ability to control its time uh, is too uh, too weak and that so Parliament can't always ask all the questions it would like to do and hold government to account to the extent that would be desirable. And the change I'd like to see is something which happens in lots of other countries where you have a committee of MPs within Parliament who get together to decide how Parliament should spend its, its time each week, and that that gets decided by a cross-party group rather than by the government as at the moment. Um, and that it, the representation on that committee represents the, rep the um, how many, the sort of proportion of, of MPs across the House. So the government would have more MPs on that committee than the opposition and so on. Uh, but it is a discussion that happens rather than just being dictated by the government. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I would just dispute that it is dictated by the government. I mean, the government gets a lot of what it wants, but it actually negotiates what it's going to put on uh, with the opposition. It has to do that in the House of Lords, in fact. Uh, and um, uh, I mean, I'm, not saying, it can't, it I'm not saying it can't be strengthened, yeah. but I'm, I'm not saying that the government just steamrolls everybody with its its business it it tries to but it doesn't always succeed we're gonna to have to stop these two uh you <laughs> you have been totally brilliant both of you sorry for firing so many questions at you thank you to all of the assembly members for such a brilliant group of questions and i'm just going to give something away about myself in terms of where i am on one of the earlier debates um except uh i'm a i'm a person of compromise too uh i think we can vote for both back to kayla yes so the cat's Third joining person in. I've seen with a cat on camera. Yeah, there's been a few. <laughs> so no, no we're, going to, we're going to pop you back into your breakout rooms. There's been a lot of different perspectives shared by Stephen and Hannah there and some great questions. Thinking back to the, the some earlier questions that Meg posed right at the beginning of the afternoon, all the information you've heard, to really start thinking, well, just to start tying things together today, not really, it's not going to be the end of the conversation by any means, but you know, what are some of the, the benefits or the pros and cons, benefits or risks, pros and cons of having a strong or stronger parliament? And I'll see you just before 4.30. Okay, look, thank you all very much. Um, it, has, it has been a long day and a lot of information, but hopefully 
the conversation that you started having there at the end about starting to bring some of these ideas together and start to think about, well, you know, what are things that could be beneficial about change or doing things differently? Or actually, is the system that we've got working really, really well and doesn't need to be changed? 